What's up, guys? So they say that the best things come to those who wait. And it's safe to say that we've been doing a lot of waiting over here. It always feels like there hasn't been a lot done, but I think looking back, there's been quite a bit of progress. So let's jump right into it. The first really big thing is that the heating system is more or less finished for the building itself. I have been so fortunate to be working with the plumber that I have. I mean, not every contractor is great. The plumber here is great. He is an absolute artist. I, I jokingly call him Prince. There's a few things that I'm pretty good at. I'm a terrible electrician. I couldn't I couldn't rewire anything. I'm a terrible carpenter, but I am a halfway decent plumber. I actually know what I'm talking about and I know what I'm looking at when it comes to plumbing. This guy, this plumber, is so above my head it's not even funny. I've mentioned that in a couple of videos, but this is his magnum opus as far as I'm concerned with this heating system. It's just this work of art. I'm so happy with it. It's to the point now where I was planning on doing all of the, the heating lines and everything like that to the tanks because we did that in the greenhouse ourselves. But seeing uh, this guy's quality of work, I'm not only leaning on him now to do the heating coils for the aquariums, but I think I'm going to have him do all of the aquarium plumbing, period. Now, a part of me is thinking, you know, maybe I shouldn't because... You know, that's kind of part of the hobby, right? And it's like, if you're going to outsource everything, at what point does it all stop? But then I thought, you know, I've done the hobby now for over 30 years. I pretty much have gotten every bit of enjoyment possible out of doing water changes. I don't have to do another water change for the rest of my whole life, and I'll be good. And I think plumbing is kind of like trending towards that same direction there's not a whole lot of fun in it for me. I actually just want to see it done and done really, really, really well. That's what's going to, I'm going to derive the most enjoyment out of. So there's a really good chance that this plumber will be doing all of my aquarium plumbing. Regardless, let's, uh, let's talk about the plumbing job that he has done as far as his heating system is concerned. So the heart of this heating system are these three boilers. There's one system that's the white one, that's the Navion. That is only for like the faucets and the showers and things like that. The other two, it's like a tandem lock and var system. Those are industrial, um, industrial hot water boilers. They're tankless. They are individually about 200,000 BTU a piece. But the reason why they're professional and industrial grade is like how customizable they are. We're going to have to be tweaking these, we meaning my plumber. Whenever you have a system that's this complicated, there's a lot of room for customizability. So for, for instance, with these, um, these particular boilers, you can set them up to run in tandem together. You can have uh, them switch on and off between each other. You could have it so that when the heat is called, this one activates. The next time heat is called, the other one activates. You can have it so that if one is operating above 50%, the other one will kick on also to like bring them both back down to a lower temperature. You can even have them react differently depending on what the outside temperature is. There's a temperature probe sitting outside of the building and based on what it's seeing outside, it can determine how hot to fire on the inside, if that makes sense. So yeah, it's a really cool system. Now, what is going on with this huge bank of just pumps and piping here? It's actually fairly straightforward if you kind of like just follow the different lines. The entire downstairs floor, the concrete floor, is a radiant heated floor. And there's two separate zones of heating that we have down there. You can see some of the, the manifolds that distribute the heat throughout the floor here. 
it's two completely separate zones that's operated. Each zone has a singular recirculation pump. On this wall, there's a total of 12 pumps. So what's the deal there? There's gonna be four aquarium systems downstairs that this will be heating. You have four pumps, one for each of those. There's gonna be a separate zone heating for the saltwater makeup container. Right now, what we do at the greenhouse is really kind of dumb. We have to like make the salt up pretty much on the spot for every water change, and then we let it stir around for a few hours, and then we just kick it on. Definitely not ideal, right? Over here, we're gonna have probably a 1,000 gallon container just for salt water. And I want that to be at the correct salinity and at the correct temperature. So it will have its own heating coil in that 1,000 gallons. So whenever we do uh, have to top off with salt water, water change, whatever, we are going to have pre-made salt water at temperature. So that's so far, what, seven pumps that we've covered? The next five pumps are actually going to be for the greenhouse system. Our heating system at the greenhouse, it's, it was a great first attempt about, you know, seven or eight years ago. It was a good try. Uh, it's worked really, really nicely this whole time, but it's also not ideal because we have five systems over there, but it's only controlled by one of them, meaning that when, let's say, the first group of tanks wants heat, the heating system turns off for, on for all five systems. If the fifth set wants heat, that's too bad. It doesn't get heat. It, it only gets heat on when the first system decides it gets heat. So you could have these temperature swings going on in other tanks. Alternatively, the, that first system could be calling for heat, for heat, but another system is overheating, and it's gonna continue to get overheated until that first set is done getting the heat that it wants. So what we're doing now is we're having this new heating system at the new building not only control the tanks in the new building, but also control the tanks in the greenhouse. So each tank now, five systems in, in the original greenhouse, will have independent heat control. Now, what's really kind of interesting about this, this is just the heating side of things. We will also be doing a cooling system using the rainwater collection cistern that we have buried out back. So that collects rainwater and the rainwater down in the cistern, it remains at about a 55 degree temperature point and it's 10,000 gallons. It's quite a large body of water sitting out there. And we will be doing a similar pump zone system to do the cooling as well for both the tanks here in the new building and the tanks in the greenhouse. So I'm gonna be really um, bringing temperature control to a, a much higher level at both the greenhouse and here at the new building. Something real quick about how these relays are set up. So each of these pumps gets triggered by a control relay. Now on the left here, there is a box with three relays. Now what those relays do, the two on the top are designated for the two zones of floor heating. But we have a third one that's just a blank one, just in case if one of those two relays malfunctions for some reason, we can quickly rewire it to use the third one as a backup. The next one right next to it controls the five zones of heating in this building. So that would be the four aquariums plus the saltwater makeup. And then it has a sixth blank relay, again, for redundancy in case we do need to rewire something. And then a little bit of a space to kind of differentiate all the zones that are in this building versus the zones that are over next door at the greenhouse. That has five zones of actual heating. And again, a sixth blank relay for backup. So you can see here that we've run all this tubing from the boiler systems downstairs across the ceiling and they're going to be providing the heating and cooling. All these tubes make their way to the central 
area of the new building because that's where we're going to be doing all of the maintenance stuff. So all the sumps will be there and everything. So what I really like is how uh, the plumber has set up the lines as far as how they come down and into the tanks. Or not, I should say that they come down and into the sumps. The sloppy thing about working with a lot of this cross-linked polyethylene tubing is that it kind of, it, it's bendy and stuff. But what he's done is he's, uh, he's made PVC guides. So for corner guides and as well as guides for when they come down vertically. And so everything is like really neat and organized looking. I really appreciate that. So the four lines that you see here, two of them are for heat and two of them are for cooling. So if you can imagine uh, the first two, the, the water will flow in, loop around a whole bunch of times, and then come back. So there's like a, a supply and a return for heat. And similarly, there's a supply and a return for cooling. Again, completely separate systems, one heating, one cooling. There's gonna be an additional two pipes that are gonna be coming down. Now, one thing that I've always wanted was really easy access to both fresh water, purified, obviously, and salt water at the sumps. So instead of like running hoses from our, our water containers and all that stuff, I wanted basically a faucet, one for salt water, one for fresh water at every single sump here. But we're also going to be replicating that same system at the greenhouse. Pretty much all of the, the, the water treatment will be here at the new building, all the water storage, all the salt water makeup, again, brought up to temperature and made available to both buildings at strategic locations to make everything super easy to get to, super easy to top off tanks. It should be a dream to work here. Continuing on a little bit, we are starting into doing the ceiling work downstairs. I think a lot of people had questions before. It's like, are you gonna leave all that exposed wood? Cause that's gonna have humidity issues. And you are correct. It would have had a lot of humidity issues. So we were at different times thinking maybe we should paint it. Maybe it'll just be fine and we don't have to do anything. That's fat chance of that happening. Uh, so we decided to finally just bite the bullet. What we're gonna do is we're gonna pack that thing full of insulation because I am really big on noise control and just like the footfall and all that stuff. I wanted to, to pretty much eliminate all of that. And then we would put up a six mil liner, that plastic to prevent any kind of humidity from entering that, and then putting uh, the, the paneling on top of that. So we've gotten about half of the downstairs ceiling done. And the reason why we can't get any further is because both the plumber and the electrician have a little bit more to do in that ceiling space. And once that happens, my finished carpenter can then go ahead, complete the rest of the insulating and paneling up there and then we can call in the painter and finish up that painting job. So there's still a little bit of work to do there, but it's not quite as much as it might seem. Now, once all of that is up, I really like how solid that, that area became because the part that is done is under my studio, which we can talk about in a little bit as well. Before we talk about the studio though, I was really hesitant to go and do a lot more with HVAC because I really wanted to leverage as much as possible air exchange. There's gonna be four HRV units downstairs to constantly swap out air. I was hoping that that would take care of the humidity issues if there were any, which obviously when you have thousands of gallons of, of salt water, you're going to have plenty of humidity issues. This summer pretty much sold me on the need to have some sort of air conditioning or dehumidification, period. We've had a pretty uh, damp summer, a lot of rain this summer. It was downright swampy in this building. Now, granted, we didn't have the air handling systems running, but I don't think it would have made any difference because it was so humid outside. All you're doing is swapping in humid inside air for humid outside air, and it was going to be pretty rough. Long story short, the air exchange system will work beautifully in the winter, and that's like that's the important 
thing, right? You need to be able to dehumidify effectively in the wintertime without freezing your place out by opening windows. And that's what those HRVs will do for us. Now, for the summer times, I had to make the executive decision and we needed to do air conditioning. We started off with two air conditioning units. There's going to be a main central five ton three phase unit that's gonna be going in right here. And hopefully, Hopefully this is all that this building will require to kind of tamp down the humidity and keep everything at a relatively comfortable level because the building is very well insulated. Whatever you set the temperature to, it's gonna maintain it pretty well. And by set the temperature, I mean whatever the tanks are gonna be. So it's gonna be probably 77 degrees. But the humidity, I want that thing to have some kind of ability to control that, right? If this is not enough, I kind of thought ahead and said, okay, Let's go ahead and put a second line set for a second air conditioner and hope we just don't need it. But if we do need it, I want the hookup to be super simple. You just bring in the unit and all the different lines for the coolant and the electrical and everything like that is just ready to go. Theoretically, I might have two giant air conditioners at some point, both five ton units, three phase, but hopefully I'll just need one of those, the one that you see here. The second unit is in the studio. And in the studio here, we have a PTAC unit. This is what they put in like hospitals and nursing homes and things like that. It's an in-wall unit. It's kind of neat in that it has both the heating and cooling. We have insulated this studio so well that it is essentially its own zone, period, end of story. We have the door wide open and the heat from the downstairs comes up through all of these big open cutouts, right? So it's essentially the downstairs and the upstairs, it's more or less one zone, right? When you're talking about this studio, there's, I don't know, R20 something in the floor. It probably has something like R18 to 20 in the walls, another R30 something in the ceiling. It's, it's an ice box in there. We leave the door wide open and no heat <laughs> makes it into this room. It is noticeably chillier in this particular room, which I guess is fine because now that we have this PTAC unit, once it gets hooked up electrical wise, yeah, it will be able to control the humidity and the heat in this room all by itself. And whatever we set it to, it's gonna stick around at that temperature for a good long time. The last thing to cover about the studio here is all the sound paneling is finally up and installed. The first grouping of the sound panels is what I kind of DIY'd. It's those Oralex dark charcoal pieces that you see in like a four foot by six foot section. I've put four on the walls and then an additional four on the ceiling. And that really, really helped dampen all of the reflection. I then added bass traps on two of the corners. And then I added some corner traps, which they probably don't do hardly anything, but I decided just to, I guess, smooth out that little section of the room just a little bit, whatever little bit that it does. It didn't cost a whole lot, it was easy to put in, so I did that. Then, one of my friends, his dad is moving into a new house. He used to have like a music room and he had this like these professional sound panels and he's they were sitting in the sound room doing doing what they do they just sit there right you know, they don't actually get used they were in great shape and i got them for a pretty good deal so i added nine of these professional two foot by four foot sound panels just having them sitting on the ground here we haven't mounted those on the wall just yet but just having them sitting right there where they're going to go they've also really done a good job knocking down the reflection that I hear in the studio. Once we start putting in furniture, once I put, start putting in some sort of truss system up above to hold the lights and the microphones and everything like that, I'm thinking that a lot of that will just break up the sound. And whatever we do in there from that point on, you're not gonna hear any of this, of this reflection. I cannot wait to move into the studio. But, there's always a but, right? The real big reason why I cannot move into the studio right now is because we don't have internet to this building. There's a two inch conduit that connects this building to my basement at the house. 
I was just thinking, you know what? It should be really easy to fish a fiber optic line from the new building to the house. No biggie, right? It's such a gig it's a gigantic line. A two inch conduit is huge to get one cable through. But I've tried it two different methods. I've heard of like uh, tying basically your your drawstring to some kind of like parachute type material, like a plastic bag. And on the other hand, you vacuum it up with like a shop vac. I have got a nice shop vac and I'm getting great suction from the other end. But for whatever reason, it just gets stuck along the way and just makes like a rat nest of string somewhere in my in the pipe. That didn't work. I tried it from both ends, that didn't work. Then I got like a fish tape that I could do, cause the distance is, I don't know, 300 feet. So I got like a 400 and something foot fish tape and doggone it, it, would, it could get within 10 feet of where it needed to go. But the last couple of 90 degree bends, after all that distance, it wasn't, it wasn't happening. Again, we tried that from both ends. So I'm just gonna call on the pros. I was on the phone today with a company that professionally installs this stuff and I said, hey guys, all you need to do is get this cable from point A to point B. Everything else is sitting here waiting for you guys. And they said, fine, we'll just do some hourly arrangement. I tried it guys, I tried it. It wasn't happening, so it's time to call on the pros. Like I said, I can't wait to move my whole operation out there because as much as I, I like to work in my own house, uh, my cats like to mess with me. There's a lot of car traffic and all of that kind of just goes away once I'm in the new studio. All right guys, that pretty much does it for this little bit of an update. I wish that we had even more progress. Obviously, uh, I can't wait till this whole project is done and we actually have aquariums and whatnot, but again, patience is a virtue and I'm in no hurry to be cutting checks for all this stuff, so I guess there's that too, right? I appreciate all your support. Thank you so much for even being in, interested in like this building project. It's Sometimes I get, I get lost in the stress of the project itself and I kind of have to sit back and be like, you know what, this is actually pretty cool. And there's a lot of people out there that are interested in knowing more about it. So, you know, thank you guys for, I guess, keeping me level and balanced as far as that goes. And don't forget to subscribe, hit that notification thing, and hopefully there will be a much better and more significant update soon. All right, guys, talk to you all later.